Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming along to our Low Carbon Learning webinar. Learn how Lisa Ann Pasquale retrofitted her Glasgow tenement flat. The webinar is going to last for about an hour. Um, my name is Sarah Buchanan. I'm the Impact Manager for Retrofit at Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, and I'm going to be your host for today. Um, the topic today um, will show the practical approaches of doing a domestic retrofit of our very Glaswegian tenements. I'm really excited about today because I live in a tenement and it's very drafty, so I'm looking forward to picking up some hints and tips. Um, I will address some specific material issues and geometry and maintenance issues that come along specifically with the tenement flat. So before I give you some background on Lisa and introduce her, um, of course, we have to do the housekeeping, um, as with all webinars these days. So the session today is being recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel next week. Um, if you'd like to ask a question or leave a comment, then you just do it in the right hand side of the questions control panel. Um, we'd love to have uh, your input today. Um, there will be a couple of poll questions. Um, we'd like to get everyone involved today and, and your opinions really matter to us. Um, so we'll also be asking for your feedback after the session. Um, it's extremely valuable to us to let us know um, where we can improve and um, yeah, we'd love to get your feedback on the session today. Um, the session today is part of our low carbon learning programme, uh, which has been delivered through the National Training Fund, funded through the Scottish Funding Council. And essentially we've been offering practical training in the factory here at Blantyre, um, mixed reality, which brings in the digital element and, and online courses in retrofit, passive house and our new course, Fabric and Structures for an 80 building. So these can all be accessed online. They are completely free. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about the training after our session today. So um, without further ado, we're going to have a, a quick video and then we will move on to our first poll. So I hope that gives you a good idea of what we're currently doing in the factory as part of the training program. And I would now like to invite um, you to take part in our poll. Um, so on a scale of one to five, what is your level of knowledge of Enerfit as a standard for retrofit in the built environment? Um, so this is currently being done um, in the main through the Passive House Trust. Um, and if you can um, do the quick poll, that will let us know where the knowledge um, stands currently. Um, I'm currently doing a series of masterclasses um, with the Passive House Trust, which have been really good. Um, so yeah, if you can let us know what your vote is and I will be able to, yeah, so quite a lot of you then, 39% have absolutely no knowledge. So hopefully by the end of today's session, um, we will have been able to uh, increase your knowledge and awareness and, and get you interested in, in potentially signing up. So, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Ann Pasquale. She is a Retrofit Coordinator and Technical Lead at Retrofit Works. Um, she's a fantastic speaker. Um, and in, at today's session, um, uh, we're going to hear about her, her journey for her Glasgow tenement. She's an academic background in building physics, 
and architecture and has conducted a range of performance evaluations at new retrofit and refurbished buildings. She uses building forensics as part of an evidence-based approach to low energy and uh, really looking forward to, to hearing about your, your tenement flat, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yep, yes, we can see it. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks for that. Thank you all for coming today. Um, so I'm going to do a presentation on my my wee flat um, on the south side of Glasgow that I've been working on um, for the last, <laughs> last six years. Like most like most people who who work in construction and buy a property, it takes quite a while to get it done actually. Um, so I'm I'm down in Shawlands. I've got, uh, as you can see, kind of traditional blonde sandstone tenement um, ground floor position. Um, and being kind of a specialist in, in low energy construction and low energy buildings, I sort of decided that I needed to, um, yeah, uh, take my own advice and buy a property that um, needed quite a bit of work um, and figure out how to do things as properly as possible. Um, and preferably as cheaply as possible, um, and also learn quite a bit about uh, a lot of the pragmatics of um, dealing with certain materials um, on these traditional buildings. So um, a bit about my my wee home. Um, as most of you will recognise, it's a pretty standard one bed 1901 ground floor Victorian tenement. Um, it still had the two um, bed recesses in the middle, which uh, often gets turned into a kitchen, um, a wee hall off the close, uh, main bedroom on one side, living room, giant kitchen in the back, um, and a wee bathroom. So uh, it's about as you would expect um, for most tenements. This one hadn't been updated since the 70s. It had, um, it was quite a mess. It had three sets of electrics in it, none of which had a ground wire in it beyond uh, to the cooker and to the electric shower. Um, it was it was a proper proper mess of a flat when I got it. Um, it has external walls as you'd expect, about 800 mil of solid um, uh, limestone, limestone, sandstone. Um, except that the window reveals suspended timber floor, internal walls plastered on the hard, um, pretty rubbish first generation double glazing. Um, the boiler and the electrics were deemed end of life at the survey. Um, and yeah, like I said, it was uh, the, the electrics that I had when I moved in were, were outright dangerous. Um, so I actually lived in the flat for about three months with no electrics. <laughs> um, so private front, front garden, um, communal close um, and a communal back garden. So one thing that kind of struck me quite quickly was the fact that because we've got um, communal ownership in tenements, things don't always get fixed as quickly as they should because sometimes zoners do kind of drag their feet about getting you know gutters cleared out about getting roof repairs done and stuff like that um so i was always quite aware of the fact that i'm not completely in control um of the maintenance of the outside of the building um so you can get failures that mean you get water ingress from outside that take a while to fix just because you've got five other owners to deal with to get that sorted um, and that was one of the factors that I had to take into consideration when I was looking at how to retrofit the flat. Um, so my objectives for the flat was breathable construction pretty much throughout to protect the original timbers um, and masonry. My primary focus was on improvement to comfort because as you guys know, living in tenements, they're very drafty, they're very cold, um, especially the ground floor because you've literally got yay much timber between you and the outside world in the winter um for the entire floor surface so it was really focused on improving comfort reducing drafts increasing surface temperatures and improving the stability of the temperatures so that you don't get the wild fluctuation of you switch the heat on it gets really really hot and as soon as it switches off uh the house gets really cold again um so those were the sorts of things i was trying to focus on so there was a secondary focus on energy savings um, and that was primarily because if i actually had heated this house to the point where it was comfortable i probably would have bankrupted myself quite quickly um so um yeah <laughs> the energy saving was was a bit of a nice to have um given the fact that it, it wouldn't have even been affordable to, to heat the property fully when i first got it um so to, to do the aim was to actually create a low energy flat that still retained a lot of the character of the victorian property so as you know from uh anything to do with kind of property values there is quite a, a bump in value when you can retain a lot of the period features 
And one of the things that I kind of felt um, as a professional in this area is that a lot of people seem to equate um, low energy measures, low energy retrofits with making things look modern, ugly, um, or just generally, you know, not not traditional. Um, and to be fair, that's probably because most people's solution to insulating buildings is to whack a bunch of Kingspan on. Um, so fair enough, yeah, that's, that does not look like a traditional building. Um, so the idea was to be as sensitive to the original construction as possible, um, to bring back as many of the features as possible, um, and to protect the original structure as much as possible. <clears throat> so the retrofit me methods I went for, uh, so first and foremost was underfloor insulation, so that's, that's a big easy win. Um, extensively draft sealing the floor. Um, again, really big win. When when I first moved in here, um, if I stood in my kitchen in a nice skirt, um, I would do the kind of Marilyn Monroe thing. Whenever the wind blew, um, my skirts would just kind of fly up because it was so drafty coming through the floor. Um, the walls were mostly draft proofing only um, at the joint area around the bays, except um, where I've done quite an extensive retrofit of the walls, uh, wall insulation in the bathroom. Um, LED lighting throughout, upgrade to a high efficiency gas combi. Um, in hindsight, I wish I had gone for a, a traditional system boiler with a tank. Um, I didn't just because of the space issue, um, but I actually would have gotten much better efficiency out of a system boiler. Um, I used cast iron radiators um, specifically for thermal mass to match the, the building fabric. So one of the issues you get with temperature stability is when you have lightweight radiators, um, like we traditionally kind of, we tend to get from, you know, B&Q or, or screw fix, those lightweight either aluminum or steel radiators, they heat up very quickly, they heat up to a fairly high temperature, and then they cool off very quickly. Uh, the advantage of cast iron radiators is they hold the heat for quite a long time after they've been heated up. Um, and as you know, with the big masonry buildings, big masonry walls, those take quite a long time to heat up as well. Um, so if you actually match the, the thermal mass of the heating system to the thermal mass of the fabric, you actually get better efficiency and you flatten out some of those kind of severe peaks and troughs of kind of heating. Um, so that was why I went for the cast iron radiators. Um, minimum A rated white goods, eventually I'll get the timbers, the, the windows replaced, um, though at the moment, uh, timbers at quite the premium. Um, and vapor open materials throughout. So there were specific things I didn't pursue um, quite intentionally. Um, so there's an option of doing cavity wall insulation behind the lath, uh, where I've got lath and plaster. Um, basically, the size of the windows and the presence of one chimney on the external wall means I actually don't have very much external wall. Um, so there was relatively little value in doing that, and actually it's quite a high risk. Um, a U value for an 1800 mil, 800 mil solid stone wall is actually near 0.8 to begin with. Um, you add cavity wall into that little lath, um, you get a little bit of a bump in U value, you get a little bit of a bump in comfort, but the knock on is you actually get a very high risk of interstitial condensation at the floor and ceiling joists on either side. Um, and basically, it just is, was not worth the risk. Um, so IWI, um, I also didn't presume in most places for the same reasons as above, plus it would destroy the cornicing, et cetera, with the exception of where I've done it in the bathroom, which I'll show you, um, was down to the fact the previous cowboy builders that put the, ba the, the previous bathroom in had done such a rubbish job, they'd ripped all the lath and plaster off anyway, they'd ripped all the joinery off, they'd ripped everything off. So once I took their bathroom out, I might as well have done the IWI because it was raw stone anyway. So I'll show you that. Um, key things of discovery. Um, so yeah, in construction retrofit, discovery is the process of uncovering how much more expensive the project will be compared with your initial assumptions. Um, so the good things that I found, um, I basically walked into my flat with a, with a wrecking bar. Um, all the original doors were there. They were just covered up. All the shutters were there, um, which was brilliant. Um, all the original cornicing. The floor was in excellent condition, which is fantastic. There was no woodworm. There was no. There was no damage. Um, it was actually really quite lucky. Um, the original plaster ceiling roses. The solemn underneath was actually very large. I can stand up in parts of it. Um, 
I'm relatively short. Um, it's a large, dry, well ventilated. Um, so that was all quite good. Uh, the bad things, um, there were three original fireplaces, um, two of the hearthstones were quite heavily damaged. Um, I found a gas line poking out through the floor, which had been basically taped up with gaffer tape. And <laughs> um, like I said, this this place was like basically a Molotov cocktail ready, ready to go when I bought it. Um, the kitchen was falling through the floor at the time because it was just sitting on a bit of MDF, which had long since been soaked through. There were three sets of electrics, almost none of which were grounded. Um, the Artex basically pulled, uh, as I pulled that off, I pulled most of the plaster off with it. Um, the boiler flue looks like it vents into the adjacent properties garden, which is technically illegal. Um, <laughs> the ventilation diffusers on the external wall aren't actually connected to anything. They're just glued onto the front of the building. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's part of the fun of doing retrofit is you find out how many cowboy things were done before you got there. <laughs> um, niggly bits, uh, nothing in the flat is square, straight, level. One side's three inches longer than the other. Um, all the stuff that's in between the floors, um, you get this kind of, um, I think what they must have done in the Victorian area, put kind of papier-mâché um, in between the floorboards to try and draft proof them. That then got kind of, coal soot got added to that so you just had nastiness in between the floorboards which had to be all scraped out and hoovered up which was quite a task um <laughs> that was my lovely water system which had rotted out part of the floor um and two of the floor joists um there was actually a live electrical socket in there that was sparking <laughs> um so i had some some fun things i had to deal with um so the biggest the, the biggest first thing to kind of deal with is just the drafts in the property um so dealing with in between the floorboards um so traditional timber floors um there are different ways of doing this um honestly if i were to do it again i would not do it this way um i decided to go for using timber slivers in between the floorboards to create a solid timber surface um, that would effectively create a line of air tightness across the top of the floor um, and partly I did this for the aesthetic, um, partly for uh, the fact that the floor was a little bit creaky. Um, so this actually took quite a lot of the creakiness out of it. Um, it looked actually absolutely beautiful, um, still looks absolutely beautiful. Um, but <laughs> uh, if you've ever done this, it is absolutely backbreaking work. Um, you have to basically put PVA on each one, hammer it in after you've cleared out the joist, um, then plane it down. Um, so quite consistently from one end of the room to the other to actually get a really tight fit and push the floorboards into each other and get it actually very very snug um the pva is quite brittle so sometimes you will get a bit of breakage um which i'll show you in a, in a bit um when it comes to any kind of expansion or contraction contraction of the floorboards over the seasons um, but it actually, it does make quite a big difference. So um, if I were to do it again, I would probably have gone for just a silicon sealant in between. It would have been a lot faster, a lot easier. You still could have sanded the floor. Um, so yeah, there were much faster and easier ways of doing this than, than timber slivers. Um, air tightness at the skirtings. So I had two ways of going about this. Um, so in a couple of the rooms, the skirtings were left in situ because they were actually in decent condition. Um, and in a couple of the other rooms, all the skirtings had to come off because they'd been drilled through and ripped apart multiple times for various electric things. Um, so what I did is took a specialist air tightness tape um, and used it to seal the gap that you typically have between the underside of the skirting and the floor. So what this does is prevents where you've got that line of cold air that can seep in around the perimeter of the floor. And this this goes around the perimeter of every room um, in the house. So it's quite a lot of air leakage that comes in through there. So that specialist air tightness tape goes on. And then I just took a bit of MDF architrave from B&Q um, and pretty much whacked it on over top to hide it. So it looks like a slightly funky looking skirting, skirting board. Um, but it has a completely draft sealed edge to it, which is actually very, very effective. Um, and you can kind of see from the thermal image, this untreated bit here, 
uh, where it hasn't been sealed. You can see the cold air coming in around that perimeter. You can see the cold air has been stopped by the tape, and then you can see um, how much warmer the floor is right up to the skirting board um, where the architrave been, has been put over top. Um, where I had to replace the skirting boards, pretty much same idea, um, except the, the tape went onto the wall instead of the skirtings, and then the skirtings were fitted over top of that. Um, so these were all put in, and as you can see where the skirtings have been taken off, you get quite a lot of air leakage at the perimeter, whereas once the tape has gone on and the skirtings go back on, um, you've got a very consistent temperature across that corner. So there you go. Um, I have put uh, I have put a wee wood stove in now, um, but my uh, basic solution to the one fireplace that was open was to temporarily seal it with just a chimney sheep. Um, so it's now got a wee wood burner in there. Um, so it's sealed most of the time, except when the wood wood burner is running, obviously, and and pulling air up through the through the flue. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, that's my favorite bit. So um, as as Sarah said earlier, um, I was trained as an architect, but um, when I was in architecture school, I trained also as a bench joiner. We had a, a very nice wood shop in my architecture school. So I worked in the wood shop for about four years as, uh, as a safety assistant. And the, the guy that ran it basically trained me as a, as a bench joiner to make furniture. furniture. Um, so I've got quite a lot of half decent joinery skills. Um, so I have made a bit of a meal out <laughs> of fixing a lot of the traditional joinery. Um, so one was uh, a traditional kind of window bay that you would normally see in tenements. Um, so once the radiator was replaced with a with cast iron, you had this kind of um, big open space. Um, what I really wanted to do, because it's actually quite difficult to pull this out, insulate behind it, and then put it all back, um, and I basically just didn't have the didn't have the oomph to go through that process. Um, I decided I would just make it as draft proof and as snug as possible so that I could sit next to it. I'm actually sitting next to it right now um, without feeling the cold draft coming in through the joinery, which is typically what you would feel. Um, so I stripped the traditional finishes back, um, put the air tightness tape all the way around the perimeter, um, sealed up any teeny tiny joint uh, cracks, holes from screws and whatnot with putty um, and then put uh, additional layers of material beading etc all back on top of it so it all got sealed back up um, and hid the air tightness tape behind uh, the detailing and so you can see basically all this air tightness tape here this got kind of hidden behind uh, some new bits of wood um, all around these perimeters got hidden behind the beading. Um, so this all made it a very airtight um, window bay. And once it was all finished, it looks quite traditional. It looks as it more or less would have back in the day. Um, and that was, that was the idea behind a lot of the retrofit was basically to bring a lot of these features back, um, but do it in a way that actually means they're a lot more comfortable than they otherwise would have been. Um, the heating system. Uh, my my very manky old heating system, um, very thankfully, was ripped out fairly promptly. Um, took a while to figure out that um, we did actually own a tiny sliver of land um, where we were venting out. Uh, the first two boiler engineers that were supposed to swap out my boiler pulled out at the last minute because they thought um, I was venting into the neighbor's garden. Um, so once I kind of could prove that I did actually own a bit of space behind my back my back window, um, I was allowed to swap out my boiler. Um, so I just got, went for a very high efficiency combi. Um, like I said, in hindsight, I kind of wish I'd got, done something different. Um, so the issue with this is basically, for those of you who don't know, uh, the smallest combi you can buy is probably 18 kilowatts. Um, the total heat load of my flat once all once it's all said and done is about three kilowatts so it's not very big at all the boiler is massively oversized and even if you um basically range rate the boiler right down to my i think mine range rates down to about 11 kilowatts um you're still talking about a boiler that's three times the size that it actually needs to be um 
and it basically means once you're oversized that much you're not getting anywhere near the rated efficiency that you're supposed to be getting so even though it's an a-rated boiler even though it's supposed to be 95 percent efficient i doubt it's operating at more than about 85 80 percent efficient um, and that's just down to the fact that it's so radically oversized um, and that is a problem with just about any combi in a flat is they are designed to be instant hot water heaters for showers and baths um, the fact that they can heat the house is kind of a secondary factor um, so it's, it's not the greatest solution in terms of efficiency but it's small and it saves me having a tank in my flat um, so that was kind of the trade-off um, so it all went in insulated um, and I remember when the boiler engineer came in he said uh, he said no no way do you have a chance of heating this flat with uh, with radiators that small um, and I can tell you it's it's nice and cozy in this flat now that the, the rest of the works are done um, and this gets on to a lot of the warmth um, so the floor insulation this was this was the big job this was the, the absolutely wonderful job um, so luckily my timbers were very very dry um so in order to insulate uh floors you need to make sure that you've got timbers that are no more than 20 percent wash content um so i went down checked everything um nothing was above about 18 which was quite good um and what i chose for material was uh timber fiber bat insulation um, so this was a Pavatex bats, um, flexi bats that were 140 mil. Um, and basically, if you see these things, they come in big wide bales, you cut them transversely and sort of fit them in between the joists as you go down. So they're friction fit to start with. Um, and then I've since gone under with a, a, a wind, wind and air barrier that drapes underneath. Um, and like I said, because I can stand underneath my, my crawl space, um, it means I didn't have to lift the whole floor floor to do this. Um, I could basically install it all from below. Um, so one of the key things that I had to do to make sure that the joist ends were protected um, was to basically clear and pack all the joist ends with lime putty. So at each joist end, you usually have it sitting inside the masonry pocket. You usually have quite a lot of rubble in there. So to go in, scoop all that out, all the spiders came with it and ran up my arms. Um, so my neighbors heard me screaming at the top of my lungs more than a few times when I was doing it. Um, packed it all with lime putty. And what that does um, is basically it air seals the joist ends into the masonry. Um, so what we want to worry, what we need to be aware of doing when we insulate floors is you're effectively making um, the space above warm and thus a bit moist, um, but the joist ends are gonna get much colder um, because now you've got an insulation sitting there. So you're gonna get a, a cold spot at the end of the joist where it's sitting in the wall. If any of that warm moist air from above gets down into that joist end, it's gonna condense on the joist end. It's then going to cause moisture and moisture on timber is going to inevitably cause rot. So by scooping out everything, all the rubble around the joist end, packing it in with lime putty one the air can't get in very well so you've made it relatively airtight which means you don't have quite such a risk of warm air getting down and condensing and to the ph uh basically the the alkaline nature of the lime means rot and mold really can't grow anyway so you trowel all that in um and even if they, there is a bit of moisture one the lime will let it move through as it needs to move to to dry out whichever direction it's going to dry out in um, but also it can't propagate mold spores, it can't propagate rot. So you've protected the, the joist ends from basically chemically and mechanically um, from failure due to rot and, and mold by doing that. Um, it is a, a pain in the backside job, it's very filthy um, and yeah, it's a lot of just troweling in, troweling in, troweling in, let it go off for a few days and then come back and fit the, fit the bales in. Um, but it's a very important job to do because that ultimately is what is protecting the timber from any kind of moisture damage down the road. Um, I had the guys um, basically giving me site support as I was down there fitting it all. Um, I got kind of one pallet as a, at a time um, because this was all mostly DIY. Um, so you can see basically where I'd run out of a bit of insulation but i'd done the rest of the floor by that point and also where there was a big transfer beam where i hadn't quite got the insulation to match above that um 
And this is the difference in floor surface temperatures um, in three different parts of the house on one day in winter. So it was about two degrees outside. Um, in part of my house where the floor was uninsulated and not draft proof, so I hadn't done the timber slivers yet, so you can see the gaps between the floorboards, um, the surface temperature of the floor was 12 degrees, so it was absolutely freezing in that part of the house. Where I draft proofed the floor, but I hadn't yet put insulation in, the surface temperature of the, fo the floor was 14.8. So you get a 2.8 degree bump just by draft proofing it in the surface temperature of the floor. Um, once you add the insulation, you get another four degree bump. And now you're up to a floor surface that's 18.8 .8 degrees. Um, and if you're walking around barefoot on 18.8 .8 degree floors, you're actually quite, quite cozy. Um, normal tenements, ground floor tenements, that's your floor temperature. Um, and if you think about that's your floor temperature, even if you heat the house to 22 degrees, if your feet are, feet are at 12 degrees and your head's at 22 degrees, you're actually gonna be quite uncomfortable. That's the kind of temperature stratification uh, that makes people quite uncomfortable. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of some of the measured differences. Um, so the sequence in which things were done were, was actually quite important. Um, so the first thing I did was basically seal the floor from above. And partially this was to protect any debris from falling onto the insulation. So once it's sealed from above, um, insulated, or once it's sealed from above airtight, um, it basically means that there's not going to be any um, grit, soot, dirt, um, falling onto the insulation, which then gets in between the cracks and crevices, and basically an insulation, bat insulation like this, it's the air space in between which gives you the insulating value. So if you've got dirt and whatnot getting into those cracks and crevices in the insulation, then you're actually negating quite a lot of the insulative value of the, the insulation. So there was a sequence to which it had to be done to make sure that the, the insulation was in best possible condition when it went in. Um, the other thing I did, which I think was actually both very important and also quite useful, was I used an oiled finish on my floor. Um, so it was just sanded and oiled. And there was two reasons for that. One is oil is vapor open, so it would allow any trapped moisture vapor in the timbers to dry up and out as the house was heated. So as the heat kicks on upstairs, it will dry out the timbers um, and allow that to go out. Um, if you put a varnish on, it will seal any moisture in and the, the vapor can't then get up and out of the timbers. So this helps dry the timbers, dry the floor, dry the structure um, by having, having an oiled surface instead of a varnished surface. Um, the other thing that is the advantage is because you get expansion and contraction, which is going to change once you insulate the floor because the temperature of the timbers now has changed. Um, you can patch repair oiled floors. Um, so in a couple of cases, I had to remove some of the timber slivers and put bigger ones in because actually the timbers had shrank because enough moisture had come out that they'd actually made bigger gaps in between the boards. So I had to repair a few of those over the years. Um, and basically with an oil floor, all you do is put a new timber sliver down, trim it down, sand it real quick and put another like lick of oil over top of it and that seals it. Um, so if it had been a varnished surface, I would have had to strip and had to strip and redo the entire surface finish. Um, so it allowed patch repairs. It allowed the kind of expansion and contraction that would need to happen as part of the floor insulation process. Um, and this is like some of the patch repairs I did. Is that's kind of the level that it opened up to um, in one of the rooms. So da, 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 heating. So the heating was pretty straightforward. Uh, leave that one. Um, reclaim things. So um, I intentionally did reclaim all the cast iron radiators. Um, and mainly this was just coming from a couple of heating engineers I know um, who had very poor opinions of new cast iron radiators that were coming, of, coming from China. They felt they were very kind of poor quality. So they said, by all means, go back and reclaim them. They're much better quality. And if you get them cleaned out and fixed, um, actually just fine. Um, all the original doors and shutters were redone. Um, so basically the advantage of having the shutters um, basically put back into, into functional use um, is that those actually add a massive amount of insulating value um, at night. 
Um, and as you know, our nights last quite a long time in Scotland in, in the winter. So basically those things get shut kind of four or five o'clock at night in the evenings in winter. They stay shut until nine o'clock the next morning. Um, they retain a huge amount of heat in the property. Um, so they're actually a very important insulating feature to a property in winter. Um, so as much as they are also just a period feature and a kind of desirable one from a property value perspective, from a thermal perspective, they're actually hugely useful as well. Um, use reclaimed light, light fittings with LED bulbs. And now I'm going to show you the, the really intense bit, um, which was the bathroom wall insul insulation. Um, so basically, I was I was stuck in my flat for that nine month lockdown by myself with my dog and not a he heck of a lot to do. <laughs> I decided to rip my entire bathroom out. Um, <laughs> The existing bathroom was absolutely freezing. Um, it was just painful to go in there. Uh, the room rarely got above 12 degrees despite having a massive radiator. You couldn't fill up the bathtub. You couldn't actually get a hot hot bath because by the time you filled up the bathtub, it had gone cold again. Um, and it was just an absolute Baltic room to go in. Um, so yeah, I eventually figured out that uh, let's see, remove the plasterboard ceiling, eventually figured out that it had been dot and dab plasterboard um, on kind of all the walls. Um, it had been very badly fitted um, with kind of dry lining and whatnot. And because it was unsealed at the edges um, where that floor meets the main walls, um, all that cold air was coming up behind the plasterboard, behind the dot and dab. And it was effectively creating an ice box um, out of my out of my bathroom. Um, so I started stripping everything back. Um, so everything was stripped back around the external wall. Um, and that is the original kind of sandstone wall um, with my window that was really only held in place with spray foam. <laughs> um, <coughs> so it's a bare stone external wall. Um, as you can see, the reveal kind of drops in. You've got a nice stone um, kind of sill under the window here. Uh, timber lintel above, um, we still have the waste pipe down the side. Um, all that was sort of left to dry out for a couple of a week, couple of weeks. Um, and I decided to do a internal wall insulation that was um, in a couple of different layers. So the first layer was a dianthonite insulating plaster purge coat. So this is a lime-based lime-based plaster with um, cork insulation integrated into it. So I believe there's a few <clears throat> a few different kinds of lime cork plasters. Um, dianthonite just happens to be the one that I was most familiar with. Um, and basically the idea behind the purge coat is because you've got that very rough external surface with little gaps and little kind of missing bricks and stuff like that. Um, that purge coat starts sealing all that up, um, creating a kind of solid masonry surface on the inside um, and actually kind of smoothing out the internal surface. Um, so I wanted to basically make sure that I can move, well, put a window, not move the window, put a window into an insulated frame. Um, so I use something called a compactor foam, which is a structural insulating board um, to make a new rough opening for the window. Now, in order to get a window into uh, a sort of ideal location in, in a wall that's been insulated, you need to move the window into the plane of the insulation. So this was uh, my way of doing this was create the compactor foam insulated rough opening for the win new window. Um, and then basically trowel in uh, the dianthonite, the insulating plaster on the sides to basically create an insulated holder um, for that compactor foam. So it was used to fill the kind of larger gaps in the stone and brick and generally smooth it out. Um, I used an air tightness tape called Proclima Solida, which is you can plaster over um, to deal with the air tightness junctions around kind of uh, the lintel window, um, various other places around the external wall and where it meets the internal walls, um, and then slowly built out 
all the sort of insulating um, kind of plaster work. So I built out around that um, sill under the window, basically recast it in dianthonite um, and packed that in. So uh, the one thing that I found was dianthonite has to be actually quite flat for the type of insulation that I chose. I'm not a particularly good plasterer um, and because this was done during lockdown um, it was sort of on me to actually do this correctly um, so I didn't do a particularly brilliant job of it but I did pretty good. Um, so once that was all sealed relatively flat as best I could get it um, and then I put the specialist insulation on. So what I decided to go for was um, something called calcitherm. Um, so there's a few options that you could use in this particular situation. So if it had been almost any other room in the flat, any of the north facing walls, um, I probably would have used wood fiber as a first choice, um, wood fiber IWI. Um, it happens that because my bathroom is on the southwest facing wall um, of the building, that is very, very exposed. It gets basically pummeled with driving rain about five months out of the year. Um, and because I'm ground floor location, so any leaks from above will eventually come down. Um, my bathroom wall is probably the highest risk of any point on the whole building of pretty catastrophic water ingress. Um, and basically calcitherm has got a very unique ability to absorb massive amounts of water without changing dimension so it doesn't swell. Um, it is about twice as expensive as um, as wood fiber. It's not cheap stuff, um, but I decided to go for that. Um, and partly again, part of the reason why I decided to go for it is because I do specify it very occasionally, um, not very often, just because it's so pricey. Um, but I do specify it occasionally, and I kind of wanted the experience of what it's like to work with it because I'm familiar with working with wood fiber, I'm familiar with working with other insulations. Um, I've never actually physically used this before, um, so I wanted to see what it was like because it is actually I have here, is kind of a, a board that's quite brittle, um, so it's kind of a bit unique to work with. Um, so yeah, I, I decided to give that a go. Um, the Calcitherm has to be fully adhered onto di the dianthonite. You cannot use dot and dab. Um, so basically there can be no air gap between the insulation and the parge coat behind it. Um, so all the boards had to be fit to go on um, perfect, well, as flat as possible onto the parge coat that I did. Um, so there's an adhesive that goes on the back. Um, and the thickness of the insulation, what I did was vary them to get a consistent U value across the entire bay. So basically, at the thinnest part of the the wind the wall, um, there's a hundred mil of insulation here, because remember that stone wall where the window splays in um, is only about yay thick at that point. So that's got a hundred mil of insulation. Um, the splayed sides have 50 mil, the wall above and to the sides has 30 mil, and you have to return internal wall insulation for about 400 mil down the, the internal walls, um, and that's got 20 mil reveal boards on it. So what that does is it creates a very uniform U value, it means there are no cold spots on the wall, so you don't have a risk of a cold spot creating um, a spot for condensation and damp. Um, and the varying thicknesses basically drop the U value of the wall to 0 0.43, 0 0.47, um, which is about as far as you should ever go with internal wall insulation unless you are doing an inner fit, which is a different thing. Um, so if you're doing a room by room internal wall, 0 0.45 is about is about your 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 best bet. Um, <clears throat> So the calcitherm was fixed, um, let's see, to the timber header with some mechanical fixing. So I did have to put some screws through that one. Um, the rest of it was all kind of put in as you see. Um, everything kind of shaped to fit. The sort of nice thing about this stuff um, is you can basically shape it with a knife. Um, so you can basically carve it a bit like you would, yeah, wood. Um, it's kind of interesting actually. Um, so I kind of made some nice smooth corners with it. Um, 
everything was again air sealed with um, Proclima Salida to just basically make sure that there was no warm air that was getting back behind that insulation and that there was no risk of warm air getting into a cold space where it could then condense and produce any kind of rot or mold. And again, part of the protection of this system is the fact that it's completely line based um, from the parge coat all the way to the finish coat is again, you've created an alkaline environment where most rot and mold really can't grow very easily. Um, this then was basically finished off with two layers of a finishing lime plaster, um, which I don't know if any of you are plasters, but that stuff absolutely lovely to work with. Um, I've, I've attempted like gypsum plaster a few times and I absolutely hate it, but I actually really like doing the lime plastering. Um, so that was all kind of plastered over and that was a proprietary line based finishing plaster that um, is recommended specifically to go with those boards. It was very easy to do um, and that created the final um, air tightness seal on the outside. Doo -doo -doo. Um, and then it was just painted with a clay based um, paint and again what that does is it retains the vapor openness of that wall. Um, so you could literally kind of point a, you know, a fire hose at that wall for 24 hours a day for a week um, and it wouldn't cause probably any damage um, if the, as the moisture kind of came through the wall. Um, and it's just because it is designed to basically sweat through that moisture and to allow it to just pass through and evaporate in its own time. Um, this was then basically the underfloor insulation was added after that. Um, so it became a basically fully insulated room. Um, it's now back up to a normal temperature, which is really lovely. Um, all the plumbing and all that went back in. Da, 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 and I've got a lovely finished bathroom. Um, do, 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 do. So, right, I think that's is that the last one. That's the last one. So yeah, that's all the various kind of bits and bobs that I've done to the house so far. Um, and I think we can now open it up for questions, um, if that suits. Wow, that was amazing. <laughs> I've taken so many notes, um, <laughs> particularly the spark that was about to go off underneath the water and uh, <laughs> The spiders climbing on you that does not sound uh, good at all but i have particularly problems with rats in the flat <laughs> so, um, anyway i've got loads of questions so please everybody else if you can submit your questions and um, just type into the right hand side at the, the column there um we've got 10 minutes left for questions for lisa um, and i'll kick us off but we're just going to quickly um have another poll so there was joinery skills there there was plumbing skills there was plastering skills um you know, we also have to look at the, the kind of building services element. What, where do you think that we should be upskilling the most in terms of the developed environment skills when it comes to retrofit? Um, obviously, Lisa has a lot of um, background, um, a lot of um, skills herself, um, but we really need to be taking these skills out into the market. And it's just to get you an idea of what you think, um, where you think we should most be um, developing these skills. We're obviously doing a lot of skills work um at CSIC um and we're interested to find out what what people think so yeah I think yeah it's the it's the actual skills the DIY skills the um the joinery plumbing plasterers um and of course we have to think about um design um and also almost product knowledge as well um to know um what would be the best um things to use when it comes to the particular building that you're working on um, so thanks for that. Um, so we've got a few questions here just to decide. Apologies if we don't get to all of them. We will try and get back to you if we don't. Um, so we've got one. Yeah, question from Caroline. How much putty did you use? Um, right, so I got kind of, I think they're like 25 litre vats of premixed lime putty um from mike y lime um so i did get it from a specific supplier um who also supplied my my floor insulation um i completely used two of them i've got a third one lying around the flat at the moment um and 
yeah, it's it was quite variable because some of the some of the joys pockets are absolutely massive. I mean, some of them I could easily stick my arm pretty much all the way in, um, which was a little terrifying given the size of the spiders down there. So <laughs> <laughs> stick your arm in, you're not entirely sure if it's going to come back out. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, some of them did actually require just masses of putty is you just basically keep trailing in, trailing in, trailing in, trailing in. Um, and then there are other ones where it's just a very small crack that the, the thing has been slotted into. So it is quite variable depending on the way that yours has been framed. Um, yeah, back in 1901, they weren't all that specific about dimensions. <laughs> so, yeah, you're going um, to find that out as, as you do it, aren't you really? That, that would probably come out during the yeah, during the, but the fit. Yeah. For for a 70 square meter for a 70 square meter flat, you know, two 25 liter things of putty, that probably cost me 30 quid each. So it was like 60 quid worth of material. Um and then it was just a lot of labor trawling it in. Um yeah. so yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a question on wood fibre um, from Anne. Thank you. Do you have any guidance or comments on using wood fibre? Um, so wood fibre is excellent. Um, and like I said, it was it was kind of my second choice of material. Um, and again, the only reason I didn't is just because that really unique location of that bathroom. Had I been doing the north wall instead, I would have used wood fibre um, just because the north wall is so much more protected from the wind, wind driven rain. Um, it's very good material. It's a very similar build up to what I did. Um, so you would usually do a parge coat first, um, and then you would do a fully adhesive, full adhesive coat with the with the wood fiber over top. Um, it's basically really the same principles as calcitherm. Um, is it has to be fully adhered. You don't push the U values beyond about not 0.45 unless you're getting into very very high end detailing. Um, and so like if I were if I were to push the U values to say inner fit level, the way that I dealt with the joist ends, I would probably not have been able to do that. Um, so this is this is an, a kind of important point as to why why I was able to do that combination of putty in the joist ends and the insulation to the way it was. If I pushed the U values much much further, those joist ends would have been even more vulnerable. So the way that I have then seen it done is when you go for a full inner fit. Um, is that they actually put a structural beam across the joist ends underneath to support them and basically structurally support the joist ends and pretty much cut them out of the external wall completely. So they uh, take yeah, the joist ends out. Before. Yeah, and then basically your risk of interstitial condensation on the joist ends is taken away by it's the fact they're no longer sitting in the wall. Um, yeah, and that means you can then push the U values even further, you can get higher performance, but you cannot do the the a kind of quick and dirty lime putty um solution to the joy sends that i did so yeah, and it's much as well isn't it yeah so i i have seen that done once um on a very very interesting retrofit down in london where they did basically put steel in towards the end of the jo floor joists fully supported um and they just cut the joy sends off and they sealed the wall that way and they were able to get much higher u values but again once you push beyond 0.45 U value for walls, you're then into a whole different level of complexity in terms of the thermal performance of the building. Um, but yeah, the process of timber fiber is almost identical to calcitherm. It's fully adhered, it's lime based, it's a parge coat, it's vapor open paints over top. Um, so yeah, you can't go whacking um, Dulux on it. <laughs> You'll just defeat yeah, the point. <laughs> you the using. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. That's great. Yep. Um, next question is, did you improve ventilation, for example, the MBHR, now that the place is much more airtight? But I think you went for a different system, is that right? Yeah, yeah, I went for a different system, or I'm going for a different system. So um, I'm doing central um, mechanical extract ventilation. So basically, right now, the airtightness isn't that high because, like you said, the window still is what it is. It's still barely being held in place in the, in the bathroom. Yes. Um, I can literally stick my hand around that window. So um, the, yeah, once I actually do kind of finish the big air tightness stuff and get those two windows swapped out, um, the air tightness still isn't going to probably be much better than an air pressure test of like eight cubic meters per square meter at 50 Pascal. So it still is nowhere near passive house level. It's way better than a typical tenement. Um, 
but it won't be anywhere near passive house level. So the MVHR isn't quite worth the effort and the energy that it would take to put it in and the space. Um, so I'm doing a centralized mechanical extract ventilation. So I'll have an extract out of the bathroom, an extract out of the kitchen, a single fan box that then goes out the back of the house. Um, and basically, if you've got, um, if you've actually got an air tightness of uh, greater than about five cubic meters at 50 pascal, which is about the, the sort of, yeah, threshold, um, you technically wouldn't really even need trickle vents. So at the moment, my windows don't have trickle vents. Um, under building regs, I believe the new building regs that are coming in, ooh, I don't know about Scotland, um, the new building regs that are just coming in in England, um, in a couple of months time will always require trickle vents in um, but yes yeah, even from a performance standpoint um, it's not uh, it's not urgent that I put trickle vents in because I'm still just still very leaky. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks that's great. Um, did you consider textiles for thermal insulation? Uh, interesting. Um, yes and no. I mean I've got I've got big um, I've got big uh, curtains um, I say probably not really because textiles they give you very limited um, value um, so you do get a sort of value at it from you know basically just curtains and whatnot but effectively the it's the thickness of an insulation um, that actually gives you quite a lot of its insulative value so the main kind of advantage to that is if you get a, a reflective um, a sort of reflective fabric that then gives you the radiant effect um, and for that, what I actually did in my living room to get a sort of reflective um, insulation in was because I've got the old rubbish first generation double glazing. I just got a retrofit um, low E film that I put on and that reflects a lot of the heat back. Um, so that worked. Um, it gives me a bit of a mirrored finish on the outside of the house, which is a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> got to but, do what you got to do, keep that heat in. But it actually is quite a lot warmer. Um, it is very noticeable. Um, so, like, like I said, I'm I'm sitting here in a tank top. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, just the last few questions that we've got time for because we have we have had quite a lot. So sorry if not getting back to you. We will get back to you with the answers. It says amazing retrofit, um, amazing presentation. Do you know the EPC pre and post retrofit? Oh, this is going to be a condemnation of EPCs in general. Yeah, the pre and post hasn't changed. <laughs> um, it hasn't changed. Um, the only way I can change my EPC is to put solar panels on my flat. Yeah, um, there's an issue yeah, with tenement um, flats. I know that from my own, um, and EPCs also are getting looked at. <laughs> yeah, so um, and that's a it's, a failing, it's a failing of EPCs. It's it's not because the house is is the house is tremendously warmer than it was. My bill is half what my neighbor's is. Um, my heating wow. bill. Um, it's a heck of a lot warmer than my neighbor's is. Um, so yeah the epc in my opinion is not a fit for purpose tool so no um, but yeah it has not changed a lot of <laughs> academic circles as well that you know epcs yeah. need to really be looked at um um so yeah no thanks for that well listen lisa that was amazing honestly i've got so many questions but i'm gonna get in touch with you after this um and please everybody who has got more questions that we didn't get to um you know if you think of anything then do let us know we've just got um as a final um poll um if we can ask please what's your opinion what area of low carbon learning would be most of most value to you or your business we're obviously going to be continuing this program we're looking for decent topic ideas what would benefit you what would benefit your business um so anything that you can um let us know um would really help um influence and guide the rest of the program and um, we'd really appreciate your feedback so passive house standards interfit standards retrofit coordinator Yes, an awareness of all of the above, absolutely. I'm doing my Understanding Domestic Retrofit course um, in the next few weeks, and I know that the Retrofit Coordinator um, Academy. Um, so really, it just falls to me to thank you, uh, Lisa Ann Pasquale. That was amazing. Really, really interesting presentation. The photos were amazing as well. Um, you gave me lots of ideas for my third floor um, <laughs> tenement. Um, thanks to the audience for joining us. Um, I'd just like to quickly make you aware our next webinar is on the 4th of May. It's Emily Braham from Energy Sprong, which is an industrialised retrofit solution. Um, and it involves kind of a panelised solution, um, almost like a tea cosy around um, the outside of the building and a lot more technical than that. 
Um, we've also got our learning, our immersive learning modules in retrofit, which are coming online in May for Nidri Road, which is the Southside Housing Association tenement retrofit, which is ongoing, and St Sophia's. Um, we also have free spaces, fully funded, free training spaces available right now on our website. Please sign up, have a look. It's the EECB Carbon Light Contractor Training and Retrofit Bootcamp. Free funded, guys, get involved. Um, and yeah, thanks very much for your time today. And thank you again, Lisa. And um, we'll thanks. see you again soon. Thank you.